The Star Wars universe had a backstory for everyone before it was cool to have a backstory for everyone. In 1996, the book Star Wars, Tales of the Bounty Hunters was released and featured five novellas centering around the gentleman you see in this scene. I'm writer and author Scott Seeger, and in this week's book review, we're going to go over five things you will love about Tales of the Bounty Hunters. Before we begin, be sure to hit subscribe and click on the notification bell for more great book reviews. If you were a child of the 80s, you recall how Star Wars had an action figure for practically every single character that appeared in the film, even the ones that lurked in the background. There was EV-99, that was the HR representative in Jabba's palace. Ora Marco, famous for sitting in row two of the Death Star briefing. There he is back there. There was Ri Yiz, that three-eyed goat man on Jabba's sail barge. Moma Nadan, also known as Hammerhead from the cantina scene. And these guys, the bounty hunters. These five diverse stories revolve around the scene on the bridge of the Executor when they are briefed on their mission. You might be tempted to think that all five are action-adventure stories told in the style of a space western, but they aren't. IG-88's story is about an assassin droid who realizes that he should take over the universe in addition to capturing Han Solo. Dinger's story is about a genetically modified trooper who finds love on his journey. The Tale of Bosk is about a shaky partnership in which he subcontracts with other bounty hunters who have ulterior motives. Zuckus and Forlom are partners with Zuckus needing money for an elaborate surgery, and his droid, Forlom, seeking the skill of intuition, a human trait out of reach for most droids. And the fifth story, titled The Last One Standing, is about the one and only Boba Fett. I didn't expect this much depth of character from our stories, and was quite taken that this wasn't just a shoot 'em up action book. So compelling are the first four stories that when we finally get to Boba Fett's story, the one we're all waiting for, we're a little taken that it isn't the best one, as surely his would be the most compelling, right? That's not to say it's a bad story, it just surprises us that the other four are that good. These are five things you will love about Tales of the Bounty Hunters. Number one, IG-88 has ball bearings the size of banthas. The assassin droid IG-88 gains consciousness and quickly realizes that his purpose is to lead a droid revolution. He can't resist his bounty hunter programming, so he pursues hunts as he plans his takeover of the galaxy. He takes control of Mecha-3, a planet dedicated to droid construction. When Darth Vader places a large order for Imperial probe droids to comb the universe, IG-88 programs covert communication software in the probe droids so he can use them to find the hidden rebel base, later revealed to be in the Hoth system. So in essence, he has eyes and ears all over the universe. Also, every droid that leaves the manufacturing planet has an embedded sleeper code that will be activated by IG-88 when the time is right for his droid revolution. But then he learns of the construction of a new battle station that is using vast amounts of the Empire's resources. This causes him to abandon his hunt for the Millennium Falcon. His new mission? He will download himself into the Death Star supercomputer core, and the station will essentially be his new body. But IG-88 suffers from a very human affliction. He is overconfident. As he calculates his odds of success along every path he takes, we note that he stumbles quite a bit for an eccentric that fancies himself perfect. That flaw could be his undoing. This story allows us inside the head of the droids in the Star Wars universe, and maybe we understand why they aren't served in bars, forced to wear restraining bolts, and are generally looked upon as lower-class citizens. IG-88's ambitions are far-reaching to say the least, but he underestimates the cunning nature of humanoid species. I really admired the way this story encompassed the entire universe, but somehow lurked in the background of the happenings of Empire Strikes Back and Jedi. As everything unfolds in episodes 4, 5, and 6, who knew that there was a sinister omnipresence unfolding in the background, all masterminded by this skinny droid standing stage right on the Executor Bridge? Number two, there is hope, even for bounty hunters. The tale of Din Djar starts as a tragedy. He's a surgically modified assassin under the control of the Empire. His demise came about when he was in a drag racing accident with the infamous Han Solo back in his youth. Badly broken, Imperial doctors experimented with him by implanting heightened senses, quick reflexes, and eliminating his emotions to make him a formidable assassin. As doctors operate on him, he faintly recalls their banter as they literally cut away his emotions. Pity. You want that one? One surgeon says. Of course not, another doctor had replied. We don't want that. Burn it. There had been a moment of silence, a hissing noise, and the smell of charred flesh as the doctors burned away that portion of his hypothalamus. Then came love, a swelling in his heart that made him want to rise up into the air. Love. The surgeon asks. He won't need it. The hissing, the scent of charred flesh. Rage? Leave it. 
They leave him with certain emotions which they deem will benefit his career as an assassin. When Dinger gets word that his old adversary, Han Solo, has a price on his head, he jumps at the opportunity. But life throws him a curveball. He unexpectedly rescues a beautiful empath. He's able to feel something for the first time in a long time through her empathic abilities. Since Dinger can't experience emotion, she acts as a surrogate for his feelings. This is the story that surprised me the most. There's a good character arc where Dinger learns things about himself that he didn't know were still there. After the chaos of the rebels rescuing their friends from the clutches of Jabba the Hutt, the pair go to the pit of Carcoon to salvage parts so they can get off Tatooine. I particularly liked which item they ended up salvaging. You'll see what I mean. Number three, Bosk the Hunter. Transdoshians are a different kind of scum. Bosk is a member of a hunter race who collects pelts of species such as Wookiees in order to gain favor with a goddess known as the Scorekeeper. Their planet is aligned with the Empire and it was the Transdoshians that first suggested to the Imperials that they turn the Wookiees into a slave race. Well, Bosk eagerly signs up for the job of hunting Skywalker. He's really after Chewbacca's hide. Literally, his hide. He has a vast collection of Wookiee pelts on his altar to the Scorekeeper back home. A human and another Wookiee offer their partnership to Bosk since they would have access to the Wookiee information network and Bosk would get an inside scoop over the other hunters in locating the Millennium Falcon. But little does he know, these new partners are actually planning to capture Bosk. The bounty hunter will become the bounty and the hunted. But Bosk is cunning and his ship, the Hound's Tooth, has an AI system that's equally as cunning. It's fitted with security systems in the event of a prisoner breaking free. With that said, the story of Bosk was more of a techno thriller, and it does thrill. We know who the good guys are, but we also know the bounty hunters have to succeed to make it to the next book, so it keeps us guessing to the end as to who's going to come out on top. But one shortcoming of this story is that the author tells us up front of the partner's hidden mission of capturing Bosk. My description of the real mission is not a spoiler. It's told within the first few pages. It would have been better if the author had revealed this information later in the story. There's a rule of screenwriting and it goes something like this. If a character is going to do something like a bank heist and it's going to go wrong, then they should have a scene where they talk about the plan as it's supposed to go off, then actually show it going wrong. However, if the heist is going to go off without a hitch, then you don't show the characters planning it. Just show them carrying it out. Now that I've told you this, you'll notice it in every heist movie you'll ever see. An example of a movie that violates this rule is A Few Good Men. Tom Cruise tells us exactly what he needs to do to trap Colonel Jessup on the stand, and he does exactly that. He wants to say it. I think he's pissed off that he's got to hide from us. I think he wants to say that he made a command decision, and that's the end. It would have been better if they had cut this scene and just shown what he did in the courtroom so we could watch his plan unfold in a more suspenseful manner. But that's a tiny flaw in an otherwise perfect movie. The story of Bosk violates this rule by telling us exactly what the characters are doing, and then they do it. It takes some of the excitement out. But the tale of Bosk was still a fun and sinister read, and the poetic justice ending was perfect. Number four, some bounty hunters just need to pay the bills. In the fourth novella, Zuckus suffers from a chronic lung injury and is dying. As Zuckus hobbles onto the Executor Bridge for the briefing, he hides his weakness from the others. He's taking the job of hunting rebels so he can pay his exorbitant medical bills. If you want a Canadian-style healthcare system, go to the boring Star Trek universe. In Star Wars, everyone is gunning for themselves. And if the plot device of someone taking on illicit work to pay for lungs sounds familiar, it's worth noting that the author, M. Shane Bell, wrote this story a full 20 years before George Vincent Gillian Jr. created Breaking Bad. When we first meet Zuckus, his partner, a droid designated for LOM, is admiring him with curiosity as Zuckus meditates. For Lom is logical and rational as we'd expect a droid to be, but he's fascinated by his master's grasp of intuition. He notes that Zuckus's intuition is inexplicitly right most of the time. The concept of intuition fascinated For Lom. For Lom wanted that same ability. That was the one reason he worked with Zuckus, to observe him, to learn from him. For Lom felt confident he could program himself to do anything a living being could do, if he had all the necessary information. Their story involves the staged rescue of one of the rebel transports disabled by the Imperials while evacuating Hoth. They will pretend to rescue rebels, bring them to the Alliance, and join their cause in order to get closer to Solo, Luke, and Leia. Although Zuckus lacks the skills and cunning of the other hunters, he believes his intuition gives him a great advantage. And indeed, a round of meditation gives him insight into the rendezvous point of the rebel fleet after they regroup from Hoth. How does he do it? The story doesn't explain it, but it dawns on the reader that perhaps he has force powers which he has mislabeled as intuition. And like the story of Dinger, he finds that life doesn't always go as planned and opportunities for redemption do come up, 
even for bounty hunters. I really like where this story ended up. Number five, the journeyman Jaster Muriel. A journeyman sits in a cell awaiting trial for murder. He feels justified by the execution-style murder he has just committed and reflects while awaiting his fate. There is no greater good than justice, and only if law serves justice is it good law. It is said correctly that law exists not for the just, but for the unjust. For the just carry law in their hearts, and do not need to call it from afar. Years later, this journeyman puts on Mandalorian armor and takes the name Boba Fett. And yes, we finally arrive at Boba Fett's story. But first, some historical context on this book. It was released in 1996. At that time, the internet was not that great, and we didn't have all these resources like Wikipedia to give fans a lot of backstory. I'm a lifelong Star Wars fan, and I recall a co-worker in the early 90s asking me a trivia question. He asked, what is the name of the bounty hunter from Star Wars? I actually could not come up with the answer. Boba Fett was not a household name. He lurked in the shadows. His presence was fleeting in Empire and Jedi. Without the benefit of the internet, we didn't know anything about Star Wars backstories outside of what we saw in the movies. We lived a sheltered life, but that's how things were in the olden days. So a story about Boba Fett back in 1996 really brought you to a special place. Perhaps that's the reason the authors put it as the final story. I'm sure Boba Fett's story has been told 10 different ways since this book came out, but in this novella, He's a stickler for justice and has a deep hatred for Solo simply because Solo is a drug runner who flaunts the law. Han Solo is a spice smuggler. In this book, spice is a drug that seems to be on par with marijuana. Boba Fett's story starts in the past when he's a journeyman contemplating the nature of justice in his jail cell. Then we flash forward to the present when he's in hot pursuit to the Millennium Falcon and we arrive at that fateful day that left Jabba the Hutt dead, the rebels freed, and Boba Fett in the belly of the Sarlacc. The night before all this, Princess Leia makes an appearance in Boba Fett's room in Jabba's palace. Jabba has presented Leia as a gift for the night. He declines to sleep with Leia, much to her relief, and he's not afraid to tell her what he thinks of Solo and her rebellion in general. Those worlds rose in rebellion against the authority legally in place over them. The Emperor was within his rights to destroy them. They threatened the system of social justice that permits civilization to exist. I am sorry for the deaths of the innocent, but that happens in war, Leia Organa. The innocent die in wars, and your side should not have started this one. Pretty strong words for the idealistic princess. I really enjoyed this scene as few people in the Star Wars universe point out that the rebels may very well be in the wrong. After all, they are trying to overthrow the government with force. It just goes to show that one man's terrorist is another man's patriot. I found Boba Fett's conversation with Princess Leia refreshing, as the young princess has probably not been exposed to realism and cynicism in her cloistered world, although she certainly got a dose of sarcasm and eye-rolling in New Hope. The story flashes forward again 15 years. By now, we all know that Boba Fett escaped the Sarlacc, so I hope that's not a spoiler. He's still pursuing hunts, and when Han Solo, now a dignitary of the New Republic, leaves the security of Coruscant for a gambling junket, an old informant alerts Boba Fett. Solo just can't resist a weekend of staying out of trouble, and Boba Fett just can't resist bagging a hunt that slipped through his fingers all those years ago. They have a final confrontation on the gaming resort planet. Both are beyond their youth as the author describes Boba Fett's knee problems and Solo's gray hair. Their confrontation is like something out of the Wild West, or maybe the Dark Knight would be a better comparison. There's a feeling that their identities have been shaped over the years by each other, and neither one of them would have it any other way. The ending is left open for us to imagine, but we kind of did know that neither of these characters are going to be killed off in a novella. So even without that suspense, the conclusion of Boba Fett's story did leave me satisfied. Overall, I was really surprised at how good this book was as far as the diversity of characterization and story. I read two books from the X-Wing series and found them to be a bit of a bore since they were action-oriented, which isn't really my genre of choice. I mean, imagine reading The Battle of Yavin or Endor instead of watching it. So when I picked up Tales of the Bounty Hunters, I expected five spaghetti westerns and was therefore pleasantly surprised at the imagination that went into these stories and characters. So if you want a fairly light and satisfying read, you should pick up this book. If you do like this book, I would recommend Tales from Jabba's Palace and Tales from the Mos Eisley Cantina. Both are short story collections about the background aliens in episodes 4 and 6. Yes, everyone has a backstory in Star Wars, but that's what makes it such a vast and interesting universe. Maybe there's a giant book of short stories for the Galactic Senate scene and clones. Also, this was a fun video to make. I just googled Star Wars abstract art and all sorts of fan art popped up. So thank you to the fans that have created so much inspired artwork over the years. What are some surprisingly good Star Wars books that subvert our expectations in a good way? Leave some recommendations in the comments. I'd love to do more Star Wars reviews. 
Also, check out my own book, Grand Portage, about a man who drags an aircraft carrier across northern Minnesota. It's available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle. Just click the link below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe for more book reviews. And may the urge to never stop reading be with you always.